Thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, we will talk about this. Well, welcome to the panel debate, Learning to Save the World, Educating Beyond Textbooks for Sustainability. Uh, before we start the discussion, we have a few practical remarks for you all. At the end of this panel discussion, uh, there will be time to address some questions that will come from the audience. So we kindly ask you to write these questions in the Q&A section, not in the chat. Um, these questions can be outvoted by you, so they will be ranked in order of relevance to your interest. So please use the Q&A uh, to post and upvote these questions. And if you have any questions for the organizing team, uh, Christy, Lina and me, uh, feel free to email us. Here you can see our uh, email addresses. Um, so our contact information uh, is also in the Sustainability Week program. Well, um to start a little bit to spite up things um we started with an idea and the idea for this panel debate started having reflections about ways to tackle education um as a pillar of change towards sustainability at first uh, we started to discuss with lena and christy how we showcase a agenda 2030 graduate school at lund university and its interdisciplinary research approach then some thoughts started about fostering a more conscious society and transformation towards sustainability. Uh, then using education as the main channel for change was a clear answer. The first ideas came along discussing if um, educational institutions for all ages were taking more integral uh, approaches and pedagogies um, that are originally needed in order to facilitate reflection on the cognitive and socio-ecological emotional processes. Um, that are underpinning people's learning. So also kind of everyday life choices and decision makings, what we eat, what we buy, where we travel, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, what was sustainability and how the SDG number four, uh, which aims to ensure inclusive and equitable ed quality education for all, uh, how, to, how to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all included in this planet. And, and then we started to shape, you know, all these dimensions together. 
So despite the prominence of the sustainability as a concept, um, societies uh, trajectories remain or seem to, to see it like they see deeply unsustainable uh, in most of uh, the angles that we think about it. So more holistic pedagogics are urgently needed um, to address today's challenges and more efforts to highlight education as well as one of the most important powerful and proven vehicles for sustainable development. Achieving these SDGs will require um, more than the business as usual, uh, as we know it. We need uh, pedagog uh, pedagogical approaches to catalyze uh, and this necessary change that we all urgently need to see. Uh, so we wanted to start a discussion about this from our own experiences of PhD students at the agenda, but eventually we discovered that the conversation is super big and it was not limited to higher education. We needed to grab a bigger audience as well, but rather the whole educational system in terms of uh, grabbing this attention. And therefore, uh, we contemplated this opportunity to make uh, an event uh, launching today, happily, and search for funding uh, to start a dialogue about this topic, uh, to explore the potential importance of implementing um, sustainability in education for future generations. So now I hand it to Lina. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so Christy and I then uh, decided to join forces with Jessica to develop this idea further. Um, we decided to focus on the permeating function of uh, the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal 4, uh, as a way into the topic that we will be addressing in this panel today. Um, so education is regarded as one of the main solutions to raise public awareness and align our lifestyles with sustainability, but it requires significant changes in how we learn and teach. We are here today to start uh, a conversation with students, artists and professionals from Northern Europe mainly, uh, who bring examples and ideas of transformation in education for sustainability. It's a chance to uh, discuss unique educational approaches and how anyone wanting to make a difference can actually take informed action outside of the formal schooling system as well. But before we get into this discussion, uh, we would like to hear from our musician, Sonia Spiska. Uh, nurturing a dream of writing songs and teaching since 11 years old, Sonia is finally about to see all of her hard work come to fruition as she finishes her degree in teaching after five years at the Academy of Music in Malmö. Marrying her two interests, teaching and writing music, the singer-songwriter program was a perfect fit for her. And later this year, she will embark on a new chapter in her life, working full time as a music and eurythmics teacher at Augustenborg Skolan in Malmö. So Sonia, thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome. And for sharing your music Ermorio with us. Music and the arts in general are perhaps not always naturally associated with sustainability issues like climate change, for example but they can definitely play a role in the transition towards a sustainable world. Sonia, you were informed about the topic of this debate in advance when we asked you to participate. So we are a bit curious. Can you tell us what was your idea and learning process behind the composition and performance of your song that we just saw in relation to the topic of this debate? Right, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so when it comes to the music and the arrangement, to just tell a bit of backstory of how, how I did the, how I composed it, a lot of the sounds are sampled from my voice. So reusing and twisting and tuning the, the sounds that I can make with my voice and make them sound different. So the idea I had was to use, uh, was to recycle without using the word recycle in the actual song. And the lyrics, uh, well, it's a glimpse of someone who's probably working very hard to make life work. And the lyrics are also recycled. Uh, they are from the very first songwriting assignment that we got when I started at the teacher's program here in, in Malmö almost five years ago, yeah. And uh, when we were emailing about this earlier this spring, those lyrics popped up in my head. So I thought, okay, let's, I'll just use them. Uh, so, um, and I thought, well, yeah, that's because 
it's not always about coming up with completely new ideas out of nothing, but rather looking at what we got and how we can use that in a new way, uh, what resources we have, each other, stuff we've already made, and so on. So that was, that was my thought process behind this song. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for sharing it with us. I certainly enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, Christy, over to you. Yes, thanks, Lena. So uh, Jessica, Lena, and I, the three co-organizers of this, are all part of the Lund University Agenda 2030 Graduate School, where we research and learn about sustainable development. Um, we've developed the topic together, and we're curious to hear the voices of others working in fields where education and sustainability meet. So therefore, we've invited our panelists, David, Steinem, Erka, and Manal, to join us in this conversation. So I'll briefly have an introduction for each of you now. Um, our first guest, David Kronlid, is Associate Professor in Ethics and Senior Lecturer in Education. He has developed interdisciplinary higher, higher education courses and programs for over two decades now, has published five books in the field, and has an extended international collaboration background. His research interests are moral meaning making and sustainable development, environmental ethics, and climate change value education. Second, after finishing a BA in theology from University of Iceland, Steinem Knuts on Onu Dotter trained as an actor in Denmark and studied theater direction in the UK and Russia. She has worked with various theater groups as director, writer, dramaturge, and pro performer in Denmark, England, and Iceland. Her work has played in Reykjavik, Copenhagen, New York, and Vienna, and on the World Wide Web, on television, and in radio, among other places. Steenum was a dramaturge at the City Theatre in Reykjavik and the Dean of the Department of Performing Arts at IUA from 2011 to 2020. Erka Leininen works as a planning manager for the OKA Foundation for Teaching, Education and Personal Development in Finland. He has over 20 years of experience in developing solutions for integrating sustainability in the pedagogy, management, and operational culture of schools and educational institutions. In the OCA Foundation, Lenin uh, is responsible for maintaining and the National Sustainable Development Certification for educational establishments. He is also an associate member of the Finnish National Commission on Sustainable Development. And last but certainly not least, we have Manal Stolgetis, who is the Education Officer for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. She currently oversees UNHCR's tertiary education portfolio, including work on inclusion of refugees in national education systems, accountability, higher education scholarships, education transitions and protection, humanitarian development approaches, and complementary education pathways for refugees. Manal's professional expertise is in refugee protection, including durable solutions, urban displacement, child protection, and coordination. Holding a professional degree in law and a master's degree in international law and economic development, she has served in civil society, the UN, research and consulting roles throughout the Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and parts of Asia. And finally, let me present to you our moderator for today's debate, Arian Walls. Arian Walls is a professor of transformative learning for socio-ecological sustainability at Wageningen University in the Netherlands and a guest professor on whole school approaches to sustainability at the Norwegian Life Sciences University. He also holds the UNESCO Chair of Social Learning and Sustainable Development. His teaching and research focuses on designing learning processes and learning spaces that enable people to contribute meaningfully to sustainability. A central question in his work is how to create conditions that support new forms of learning, which take full advantage of the diversity, creativity, and resourcefulness that is all around us, but so far might remain largely untapped in our search for a world that is more sustainable than the one um, than in current prospects. So with that, I turn it over to Arian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christy. And uh, 
Lina and Jessica for, for organizing this uh, important uh, meeting. And I, I, I do uh, uh, um, find it, it very exciting to see that more and more universities uh, around the world um, are organizing these types of events and often they are student driven and organized. Um, and most of the changes in higher education in, in light of sustainability come from our students. And fortunately, more and more staff members are also uh, be, uh, becoming convinced that the change is is needed. Um, I'd like to, uh, to 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 maybe pick up uh, as a frame to frame the issue uh, this morning. I'd like to pick up with with Sonia's music. Uh, I, I, I that that I think it's very important that we include music, drama, theater, arts based ap approaches uh, more in in teaching and learning. Um, as they offer an opportunity to, to break with the kind of normalized way of teaching and learning that is very much focused on cognitive development, on, on skills for, for the, the working world, you might say. Um, and it, it often is a, trans, a transfer-oriented system where we transfer knowledge um, to, to, uh, to young people, but also certain values that we have over time developed in, in, in our Western world, but has been in a way exported all over the world. The values of individualism, competition, excellence, um, of expansion and growth. These are normalized in a way. And what they do is, is they affect, uh, obviously, uh, the whole earth. And going back to Sonia's, you know, when she, when she sings about the, the drum, uh, as I remember it, the drum continues but the beat is changing. And I think uh, the rhythm of the earth is changing and it's changing as a result of, of one single species, Homo sapiens, that in, in maybe less than a hundred years is altering the earth's rhythm that has been formed over more than 3 billion years. Um, so the question of learning to save the world, you know, can we do that? Um, well, the way I look at this is if we can destroy the world, which is quite a remarkable accomplishment, if we can destroy these earth systems that have been formed over so much time in such a short period of time, then there must be a tremendous ingenuity to be able to do that. So, and here's a question, and maybe David will speak to this. The moral compass that guides what we do is critical. We can as David Orr says, if we don't reflect on what we strengthen in education also, um, and especially maybe in education, on what education strengthens and what it silences and weakens it, then education makes us be become more effective vandals of the earth. Um, so here's a critical question, I think, for all of us. We know that education, just like business as usual, education as usual is not an option. And we need to find more equitable, more relational, um, more engaged, more caring ways of living on the planet. And the question, and going back to Sonia again, have you done enough? Is a question that certainly those who are in the position, the comfortable position to ask that question, because there are also many questions that we'll probably also talk to about uh, people, refugees, for instance, who are not in that comfortable question. And it might even be unfair to ask them, have you done enough to, to save the earth? Uh, but certainly as we are here this morning, we should be asking that question. Um, we must also be aware that there are many young people and not just young people, also old people like myself, who are, who are worried. They are anxious about the future and there, there are these dystopian futures looming that might lead to apathy, uh, a loss of hope um, and a culture of fear, which can lead to withdrawal from these big questions. And that is perhaps even more dangerous. Higher education, all education, I think has a, has a, a, a duty of enabling young people, um, but also the staff, to ask these bigger existential questions and to provide the qualities, competencies that people need in order to create more hopeful futures. 
So with that um, as, as, a, as a way to, to kind of open up, uh, and I'm a little bit uh, confused, Christy, because I thought we changed the order of the speakers. Um, and you introduced uh, David as the first speaker. I have him in the program as the last speaker. I don't, I don't think it matters. I think I'll stick to, to what, uh, the, what we discussed. So we'll, we'll um, um, take the order as, as the program uh, lists. So that would mean that Stein uh, would start. But we will do this discussion in two rounds. The first question we will ask the panelists uh, who have been uh, uh, introduced quite well already is what in, in their experience, from their vantage point, um, what kind of changes in educational systems are needed to, to address uh, sustainability challenges and sustainable development in a more holistic way? That will be the first question. Um, and the second one, we need to also look beyond what we teach and learn. So beyond what we teach and learn, do you see any change uh, on how, how we can learn and teach about sustainability? Does it require, uh, what kind of shift is needed? And, and maybe we need to find also, and we can talk about this, how do we change cultures and organizations to, to, to kind of abandon these deeply ingrained pathways that have created uh, this global systemic dysfunction that we find ourselves in. How do we break with these pathways and how do we get They were kind of locked in oftentimes. And what is the role of education in disrupting some of these patterns? And, 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 and that is an interesting question that we may also touch upon. So um, let me go then um, to, to Steinun. Um, and um, um, what, what are your uh, reflections um, uh, especially because you have a background in, in, you know, I can see breaking the strongholds of rationalism through arts, through drama, through theater, that that might be something extremely powerful that is missing in education. So perhaps you can, can say uh, a few words from that perspective and what kinds of changes do you feel are needed to, to move towards a more sustainable uh, form of teaching and learning? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, to all of you too, for inviting me to the panel. Uh, I am actually um, maybe <laughs> has not been uh, clear yet that I'm a part of the Agenda 2030 School. So I am doing an artistic research on uh, uh, the Agenda 2030. And my um, practice or research project seeks to develop methods of performance making that looks for positive qualities and values in everyday experiences, in routines, choices, and actions, through participatory performative encounters that enhance imagination and hope. And in, in these uh, words are, are the things that I can, uh, think that uh, we can uh, nurture in, within our educations. I'm not a pedagogue, I'm an artist. So uh, when, I, uh, when I'm, uh, uh, and thank you for this wonderful music um, uh, in, in the beginning, it, it, uh, you feel how, how the, the spirit lifts and you tap into, uh, uh, into imagination and hope. And this is what I, what I think we need to train with our, in, you know, within our educations not only knowledge, but uh, I think that you, you mentioned a few words like uh, or very important concepts of care, that uh, if we're gonna, if we want to change the world, if uh, it is changing, I mean, it is inevitably changing. Uh, what, how do we want to teach or help uh, our young people to uh, come to terms with these changes, not only to uh, kind of stop them, but come into terms with what is happening to the world. And uh, I was cycling on, on my way to this here from my home, and I, uh, and I thought that maybe what is needed is uh, for all of us to fall in love with the world as it is not as it was or but as it is because if you fall in love uh, and, and uh, then uh, if you love something uh, you care about it 
And if you truly love something, you also care about all the faults or what is happening to it. And you want to nurture, you want to, you, you invest or you, you want to stay with the thing that you love. And this can be a person, a thing, or the entire world. And I think this is my stand on, 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 uh, on what the arts can do. It, it can create connection and um, a, a felt experience of what it means to live in a world that is full of, uh, still full of uh, possibilities and, and good things. So I want to uh, uh, tell you about a project that I made um, uh, last year uh, called The Island. And it may be that is uh, the answer to, uh, to the questions. So um, I, I made a, a work in Iceland. So I come from Iceland and um, I made a work in a small island called Hrise in the nor on the north coast of, of Iceland. The inhabitants may be around 200 people and a small primary school or ele elementary school of um, uh, around 20 pupils. So um, I went there and, and the the work was about belonging, about this uh, community, about, uh, and it's called Island. And I think I have a poster here from, from, from the work. And the Island is, uh, is a work, uh, an immersive work uh, about uh, belonging, about being a part of, a, uh, a part of something and uh, your relation to the land, to this island. And an island there, it was an actual island, but an, an island can also be the, the island of Iceland or, or the globe or, or yeah. Uh, so, um, um, and, uh, and the school, the children of the primary school were participants in the project. So we invited uh, uh, them to participate in the discussion of what was of value, what, is, what were the qualities, uh, you know, absolute qualities of, of uh, the, the life in the island. And, uh, and they helped us somehow, you know, kind of uh, uh, walked with us uh, through the island and helped us create some material. And then we invited guests after, you know, we had a, a month or so in the island. And we uh, invited the, the audience, if you want, or the guests uh, to the work, and they would sail to the island. And then they would meet the children. And uh, in small groups, uh, one or two children, a uh, child, they, they took the audience or the guests uh, on a walk through the island. They went into a private home and they went into the church, so the community spaces. They would lie, you know, would go into the nature, lie in the nature, and they would communicate to the guests, you know, the qualities. And, and also, so they, you had this, uh, the, uh, a very strong bond between the child, the future somehow, and the guests and this island and, and, uh, and, uh, so the work was um, quite um, uh, successful or qu quite strong for uh, all, <laughs> all involved. I mean, for the children, for the, the um, I mean, for the school, for the uh, community, for the guests, uh, everyone. And this is a you know maybe uh, an example of a project that uh, somehow is, there you don't have. I mean. Uh, I'm a bit scared of instrumentalization of the arts because the arts are, you know, kind of, they, they are not serving anything. But this is, you know, you tap into kind of imagination uh, that something becomes uh, stronger, bigger. And in this case, you ha have the, uh, this experience that somehow uh, and, and kind of this quite complex affect of something that you learn, something that you bring to the piece and, and also uh, to um, somehow it's world making, you know, there, there is a, a kind of world making in, uh, in, in the, that happens. And I think it, it is kind of in all good artwork, there is a kind of world making that, that somehow you, and, and um, yeah, and this tap into um, imagination. Uh, 
And this primary school, of course, is um, it's exemplary. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic how they tackle because they are only have 20 uh, pupils in all stages. And, and then they, they, they have a lot of, uh, they have the proximity to the, to the uh, community, to all the different roles or, you know, what, you know, the kind of what constitutes a, a, a community. So the entire world is in this island. So, it's, uh, so whenever something happens in the island, they, the children and the school will be a part, part of what is happening. And uh, they do a lot uh, with um, uh, arts. They have an artistic residency in, in the, so a lot of the kind of international artists come to the island and they, they fall in love with the island. And I th think this falling in love is absolutely crucial uh, because through connection and, and this is tapping into why, why we need to know this, why we need to do anything is is because you need to you need to understand with your heart why you why you want the best for the world or or uh, and like Andres Nair Magnusson a, a, a novelist or a, a, a great uh, writer Icelandic he's nominated for the Nordic uh, Literary Prize uh, this year he recently um, uh, he recently published a book called Time and Water where he he is talking about the relation that you know a person living today uh, has loves someone uh, uh, has you know has yeah uh, truly has loved something or someone that spans uh, I, I think two hundred years or something because you have a relation to your ancestors and 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 the future and you have children or whatever you are nurturing so mm. so I think mm. this this uh, notion of love and and the, the big why why we should be doing what we're doing thank so you I, I will i will stop here thank you thank you um a very very inspiring introduction to the panel discussion i think uh one of the first things you said is i'm not a pedagogue and i and i listen to you and i think this is a pedagogue speaking you are talking about opening up spaces, developing connections, a sense of belonging, uh, how to create an environment where it's not instrumental, people being forced to think or behave a certain way, but where they can feel and experience a place and develop this kind of ethic of care. And uh, the, the notion of love as, as, as uh, you know, I, I also am triggered a little bit and, and maybe we will talk a little bit later uh, when, when Manal, is speaking um, who works with refugees you know some people grow up in places where it's not so easy to love and uh, but still there might be love to be found but it will be interesting to also you know we have maybe a, a somewhat comfortable position but at the same time uh, it is also here in our western northern settings an ignored uh, element uh, also because maybe we live in a in in a world where we are continuously or perpetually distracted and we don't have an opportunity uh, to 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 connect and to really to really immerse you use that word immersive to immerse yourself in something with full attention full being full body uh, full experience yeah that has become extinct almost uh, and that is uh, we need to to really find i think in education more opportunities to 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 immerse ourselves in 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 the local environment to connect with other species to get to connect with with things with materials in a more deeply way so that we can become more caring and nurturing so thank you i will come back to you in 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 the in the second round and um, I want to move to Erka, um, because I think Erka, you 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 work um, for in, for the Oka Foundation. I think one, but correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Uh, you look at at really changing school organizations and cultures, and and trying to find a way to institutionalize maybe this way of teaching and learning uh, uh, that we are now talking about, and also looking at certification of this type of. Uh, you know, do, do do we need certification? Is that the way to 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 have some kind of uh, stick or to to maintain quality? Um, so please, Erica, your reflections. 
So thank you, thank you very much, and and I'm I'm very pleased to be be invited to this panel and the webinar, and and I truly feel that it's great to be be here, and and I also recognize great resonance with with the ideas of of yours, Arjen and and Steinun, and and it's very easy to to continue with my my ideas after that. So I think that the school systems worldwide tend to reflect the goals of our modern societies which currently emphasize skills that are needed to improve things like national competitiveness efficiency profits and economic growth and then there is a nice idea that if we bring or integrate sustainable development in all education so then we can solve the sustainability crisis but I think uh, the problem is, is that it's the whole idea of progress and, and our modern worldview that needs to be changed. And putting sustainable development into the curriculum does not fix this thing. If we want to construct a sustainable future, I think it requires a collective learning that transforms our existential understanding and conceptions about the interdependence of humans and nature the essence of humanity, fundamentals of well-being, and the role of economy in our world and our daily lives. And thus, we need to turn our education systems into a new direction, which is built on a different understanding of human relationship with the world and nature. Uh, I, I think it's a kind of new sense of belonging to the world. And I wonder if this is too big challenge to the formal school system, which is subordinate to the unsustainable society. So I think that the scale of the required change is not a reformation, but more like a revolution. I want to cure a UNESCO background paper for the future of education initiative. Education needs to play a pivotal role in radically reconfiguring our place and agency within this interdependent world. This requires a complete paradigm shift from, from learning about the world in order to act upon it to learning to become with the world around us. Our future survival depends on our capacity to make this shift. So the question is not the contents of learning, but how we learn. I believe this kind of learning equals a kind of transformative process which integrates the fragmented human conception and experience of reality by uniting our spatial, local, global dimension, temporal, past, present, future dimension, and moral, individual, collective, planetary dimension. This could be perhaps done by a transformative learning process, which brings together rational knowledge, values, and our experience of reality. And as, as Arjen uh, has, has uh, told and, and, and also highlighted, we need social ecological systems thinking, which sets the limits of the biosphere as the basis for our living and welfare and puts economy into a place of a tool for fulfilling our basic needs instead of an unquestioned infinite growth machine. But most of all, I think we need a holistic experience of reality, which is not based only on rational thinking, but also emotions and embodied knowledge. And we do need love, as my panelist colleague Stenen just said. I quote also Paulo Freire. Uh, I do not believe in loving among women and men, among human beings, if we do not become capable of loving the world. And I think that the main problem of our contemporary school system with regard to this kind of transformative learning is the fact that teaching is based almost totally on the rational level of learning. This results in learning outcomes which strengthen and reproduce our contemporary society with all its faults. Uh, and the required revolution in teaching and learning in does a revolution which brings emotions, intuition, embodied knowledge and such things as central ways by which we learn, interpret our perceptions and make new meanings of reality. And finally, some, some ideas of, of my work in the Oka Foundation. Um, uh, 
Arjen asked about, about the role of certification and systems, and, and we in the OCA Foundation are, are currently uh, building indicators for a sustainable future for educational institutions. And the idea behind these indicators is to foster future orientation and transformative learning uh, from a holistic perspective, how this is integrated in teaching, school culture and management. Uh, and what comes to the agenda 2030, I've been also involved in the development of the Finnish national roadmap for the implementation of SDGs. And in, in Finland, we think that it's important that all organizations and citizens give their contribution to the agenda 2030. And therefore, we have uh, introduced the so-called society's commitment, which, which is established by the Finnish Commission on Sustainable Development. And this commitment enables all members of society, organizations and individuals to participate in the implementation of SDGs with concrete actions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, a wonderful continuation of the conversation, I think, and uh, I think you what you what you also add uh, that I think uh, is is very important is to that we must recognize the the well the power of our current economic thinking and how that is very uh, in a way uh, leading us on a on a trajectory to to, to self destruction. Uh, it's not being. Uh, sensitive to ecological boundaries, it's always expansionist, and it it is it is unable. Uh, and I like Kate Raworth's donut economy. We need to have that so social foundation with uh, with with participation, voice, democracy, deep democracy, uh, good health, and 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 the, the basic foundations that will allow us to to thrive and live happily. But while at the same time also learn to live within ecological boundaries, which asks for a shift in, in a paradigm shift indeed, uh, away from expansionist market uh, uh, driven econo economics to more uh, distributive and regenerative economies, uh, economy that serves people and planet and not the other way around people and planet serving the economy, which is happening at the moment. Um, and again, also love comes back in your and the social emotional side uh, um, which has been ignored a lot um, uh, and needs more attention and the idea of of transformative uh, sustainability and having participatory process where people together decide on the indicators uh, rather than an, uh, some kind of uh, elitist body with a lot of knowledge determining what the indicators are and then handing them down <laughs> That's not how you talk about indicators, uh, which I like. I think it's very much fitting for the sustainability kind of thinking that I'm hearing come through here. Um, so thank you. I'd, I'd like to to uh, to to go to what I think will be quite a different uh, vantage point, Manal. Um, you, because you you work uh, with rights and access to education, uh, immigration issues, I suppose, and and uh, refugees and people uh, who, who are maybe already the victim of, of things like climate change, climate urgency, um, being displaced for conflicts or wars or uh, or just looking for better lives, which is also legitimate. Um, so. Um, with your background um, in, in refugee protection and also uh, finding uh, solutions to urban displacement, um, how, how do you think schools and, and universities should engage with these issues? They, they seem for us here far away, but our lives are in a way intricately connected, you might say. So, by all, uh, so Manuel, Manal, uh, Go ahead and 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 uh, take your uh, your five minutes to to reflect on this. Thanks, Arjan, and thanks to all the organizers for including um, UNHCR's voice in this conversation. Of course, I do feel like um, I am dropping into the middle of what's a really um, insightful, I think, and and inspiring conversation. And I hope that I'm not a wet rag that comes down and snuffs out the flame. Um, but 
Indeed. Uh, so I represent the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and I do sit in the education section of UNHCR headquarters here in Copenhagen. But as you've heard, I'm a lawyer and I, I work in protection, essentially. That's what it comes down to, and I always have. Um, and in that sense, UNHCR views education very much as a piece and a, as an essential component of our protection mandate. So when we look at education, we're thinking about how to get children into school within 30 days of being displaced or looking at ways of expanding access for children and young people to enter schools in the host countries where they've fled to seek safety. And so I do have a lot to say later on perhaps about how, what the role is of universities, of researchers, of students, et cetera, in the overall mandate and project of UNHCR to protect and serve refugees. Um, but in thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I really would like to um, hopefully not be too tedious with the data points, but I would like to present where refugee education sits specifically within SDG 4, because we do engage extensively and every day with SDG 4 planning as it relates to the Global Compact on Refugees, as it relates to um, sustainable development goals in the host countries, which as many have rightly pointed to, are very, very different from our context here in Northern Europe, um, or most of the OECD countries for that matter. So just to provide some context, um, and I will go through this fairly quickly, but I'm, I'm always happy to follow up with additional conversations if, if people have missed certain points. But currently there are approximately 25 million refugees worldwide and 50% of them roughly are under the age of 18. Um, amongst those populations, we know that roughly 77% of refugee children access primary school. Whereas just, you know, so we're all on the same page amongst our populations here, the assumption is that 100% of children are in primary school. So already we have almost 30, well, 33%, 23% that are not in school. Um, only 31% of refugee youth are in secondary school. So we drop from 77 to 31. And all of a sudden, what we're talking about in terms of shaping pedagogies and learning about sustainable lifestyles is not accessible to that almost 70% of refugee youth who are not in secondary school. Then when we get to tertiary level, what we know is that roughly 3% of young refugee women and men are enrolled in university or some kind of higher education. So 3% have access to you know, advanced scholarly work, opportunities, et cetera. Um, and as situations, displacement situations become more protracted, so as refugees are displaced for 10 years, 20 years, et cetera, poverty intensifies amongst those communities. And we know that at, at its core, the SDGs intend to eliminate poverty. And I think one thing that the international community has agreed on is that SDG 4 is essential to achieving almost all of the other SDGs, right? Education runs through everything. And it's because, right, what we're talking about are these stages of education that run from early childhood development right the way up to where we are today, you know, many of us holding advanced degrees, influencing policy, etc. Um, let's see, I wanted also to talk today about fragility and conflict, which again takes us way outside of the context of Northern Europe. But this is where the greatest needs and the greatest challenges to achieving the SDGs, including SDG 4 are. Um, 2.3 billion people will live in the global south or in, in, sorry, in conflict and fragility affected states by the year 2030. And 12 of the top 15 refugee hosting countries are considered conflict affected or fragile states. And I think that it goes without saying that fragility is incredibly inefficient. Conflict is incredibly destructive when we're talking about when, we're, when we even mention sustainability, conflict and fragility are contrary to that. And this is where refugee children and youth are. This is their experience many times for multiple generations or at least multiple cycles of education. Um, and then there's the subsets of SDG4, of course, that you know, are about getting access to, to training for youth so that they can become productive and have skills for decent jobs. Um, we talk about eliminating gender disparities. And amongst refugee and displaced communities, we know that girls and young women are exponentially underrepresented when it comes to enrollment. And that gap increases as we come towards tertiary education enrollment, which is what I work on primarily. Um, 
at the country level. So when we talk about inclusion of refugees in education systems, what we are advocating for is inclusion of refugees in the national education systems of those host countries. And this is where people like us can get involved. This is where development work and the work that the governments in the North and across the OECD are doing when they're investing in these in-host communities. And this is one of the objectives of the Global Compact on Refugees is to increase the, the ability to share the responsibility for hosting the world's refugees. Because I mean, to me, it really is a stark figure when we're talking about the majority of refugees are hosted already in low and some middle income countries. That's, those are the countries that are bearing the burden and, and absorbing these young people into their education systems. 12, and again, 12 of the top 15 refugee host countries are considered fragile. So that's not just low income, that means fragile or conflict affected. Um, so I guess I, I, I don't need to go on too much longer in terms of um, how dismal and, and uh, really depressing the situation is for all these young people that are caught in these situations for many, many years on end. But um, what I wanna say, I think to, you know, to us as a group and, a, and as a community here is that we do need more um, equitable and relational ways to live. Because what we're talking about here is such a stark divide between who has access and who does not have access and who has the space to think and to create and to, uh, you know, build the relations that they want and to move where they like to be. Um, the, the, the inequality is almost, um, you know, sort of inconceivable. Um, and so, so several things that can be done and, and I can really highlight on some specific uh, mechanisms or networks or initiatives that are accessible to those of us who are in the higher education community. But um, several things that we can do right away is things like making people who are caught in crisis or in displacement more visible. So not keeping them in the shadows and not um, you know, regulating them to, to ghettos and, and not um, you know, forgetting and just leaving the problems of the global South in the South, right? Make, make refugees more visible, allow refugees themselves to be visible. And that brings me to my second point, which is paying attention to refugee led efforts. So student led efforts, refugee led efforts, ref refugee led organizations and letting them drive the agenda. And this is one of the things that we're absolutely committed to at UNHCR, the education section here is working very, very closely with students um, and, and letting, you know, allowing and letting and requesting and demanding that refugees themselves drive the agenda, including when it comes to specifically education. And then, and this will be my last point. As we, you know, as in all the places that I've worked and all my colleagues have worked, um, consistently, consistently, the, the request and the demand that we hear from refugees in newly displaced contexts is that they want education to start back up. And I know that we're, you know, we're sort of talking about a very, very high level and theoretical orientation of education. And then what they're talking about is I just want to go to school. And, but, but they're connected, right? We know that they're connected. And, and like Stina, I'm not a pedagogue, I'm a lawyer, I'm, I'm something else, but I can still, I can see that connection. And education does run through everything, um, especially when we're talking about SDG, SDG 4 and long-term sustainable development. Um, and so access to, to school at every level is, is really what we're focused on now. And, there, and as I said, there's a whole constellation of ways to engage with that. Um, mm. So thanks again for the opportunity. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I mean, you open up so many uh, <laughs> thoughts uh, in me, um, and and I, I you know I I think it's uh, um, the the way you you talk about refugee education as um, um, you know I, what you what I get out of it. Let's put it this way: that giving voice, agency, and 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 not uh, not compartmentalizing. Is, is is very important but also uh, uh and that uh, the agenda also about what constitutes uh important ed and good education should be more driven by refugees themselves uh, there might be another but that's another topic perhaps but also very interesting the kind of a lot of people i i i, I who are living under under what we would consider deplorable maybe circumstances or very disadvantageous circumstances have to learn have learned so many things in a way to survive and to live frugal lives and to 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 live <laughs> try to live as as good as they can given very little means that they have 
and, and therefore they have developed also capacities and qualities and competencies that, that we maybe should have more of ourselves, but that's another angle. Um, so thank you for, for uh, bringing in this perspective and also I think, uh, you know, the people who are uh, listening uh, and hopefully we'll be asking some questions because we're going to go after David, we'll go to the Q&A. Um, um, so hopefully with some questions will be coming in or in the chat and you can also ask them uh, live uh, if you if you prefer. Um, that that we also think about how, how what, what does this mean for how we for our future maybe careers in education or our future uh, i don't know what your uh, career path is manal but i can imagine that many people in, in 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 oecd country settings can play critical roles in 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 not just for i mean not just focusing on on um kind of um um, fighting the symptoms, which is also needed because people have in their actual everyday lives, they need support and help, but also looking at the root causes. And this is why the SDGs need to be considered in an integral, holistic way and not become numbers one, two, three, four, five, and then become a check in the box kind of mentality. It could also lead to, but to connect gender to, with climate education. Uh, many of the SDGs, as you show so clearly, they all converge in this issue of, of uh, 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 forced uh, migration, uh, people having to leave their land and so on. So thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to move to, uh, to my friend, David Kronlit. How, how, what do you make of all this, uh, David? What are your thoughts? And you come in maybe more from the moral compass that I talked yeah. about and the values and the ethics, which you often ignore, I think, in education. Yeah, I, I, I realized when you introduced me that you would have wanted me to do that, but I'm, I'm not doing that. Uh, you don't have to. In a particular way today. I mean, I'm, I'm, but first let me, let me just uh, say that I'm also grateful for being invited to this panel. And I, I really like the, the gave me a lot of insight and I will try to, in short, although in short, to try to, to, to connect a little bit to them. So, so let me first, drawing on both Arians and Erika's talks today, comment on education as usual, this, this um, concept. Yes, uh, while we may disagree on how, we all agree, seem to agree that education needs to change. And all the social environmental violence and oppression is being made by educated people. Yeah, but most of us are also the quote unquote victims of education as usual. And here we are being able to question it. So, so there is something about what is going on that seems to be right as well. And, and I guess that, that what I'm gonna say today has to do with, not with moderation, but with nuance a little bit. And uh, and this is connected to the first question, in my experience, what kind of changes in educational systems could help to address sustainable development. And to that point, I think that uh, what is important is to focus on enabling making connections in teaching and learning practices between first local SDD, SD challenges, sustainable development challenges. Second, the students' particular experiences thereof, because that is different, as we heard from, from Manal now, now lately, for example. And third, to uphold teaching and learning quality in both an applied sense and in a building sense. So, so uh, I think that what I'm trying to, to address here is the the different tensions that is involved in in education as it is today and and as it always will be <laughs> regardless of what kind of education we are being able to to create and and perhaps my take here is a reflection upon what manal reflected today the contextually emergent differences between what education needs to be becoming needs to be becoming for different people in different places under different circumstances. So we need to put our uh, analytical uh, glasses on to understand that these processes and the need for different teaching and learning processes are different because the world is different. 
And uh, the last point under this first question, and reflecting on what Steinon said, er, Steinon said earlier, perhaps love, if we allow ourselves to reflect also upon this seemingly inherently good concept, can be one way of enhancing the existential, aesthetic, and emotional content of learning processes, that is, Bildung. And uh, here love is in the words of the famous feminist Bell Hooks, and I quote, echoing the work of Eric Fromm, M. Scott Peck defines love as the will to extend one's self for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Explaining further, he continues, love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action. Will also implies choice. We do not have to love, we choose to love. And here Hooks is, is reflecting upon the, the myths of love that is reflected in our everyday uh, 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 metaphorical speak. We are falling in love. We are sort of losing ourselves in love. But, but what she wants to, 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 to underline here is that love is an act of will. And it is exactly the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. And that fits very well in also an eco-social con context. This is not how we usually think about love. It seems a little bit boring because we want to fall head over heels in love with some amazing person and, 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 and lose ourselves. But uh, the book is awesome. It's, I think it's called All About Love. So read that if you like. I think it, it has a lot of quality in this context. Okay, second, beyond what we learn and teach today, do you see any need to change how we learn and teach about sustainability? I think the main challenge is fundamentalism. Fed by our need, or perhaps I should say urge, for seemingly static and simple solutions, whether that being sexy concepts like resilience, value foundation, or love. On the other hand, there is also risk in this context that teaching and learning becomes as complex and fragmented as the challenges that it needs to be dealing with. So what we are trying to, to, to navigate is sort of a conceptual stability, adaptiveness, effectiveness nexus in education. So education needs to be stable, but it should not be fundamentalist. It should be sort of allow for a, 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 a multiple of concepts and methods in order to change according to the, to the sustainable development challenges. So it needs to be adaptive as well to the local and to the global. And it needs to be effective because it needs to produce, the students need to have good grades and all that. So this nexus is tricky to navigate in formal education, but I think that it's something that needs to be addressed. This kind of conceptual fundamentalism, I think, is the, the, the biggest threat for, for us if we want to expand education into this aesthetic, emotional sphere. Thank you. And one thing more. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. So the third question, how do you approach education for sustainability in your own work? Well, I talk, teach, supervise, I write books, music, stage poetry, and occasionally I write scientific articles because I have to in, in, this, in this career. Uh, and as an ethicist and educator, I'm using my, in collaboration with friends and colleagues, sustained academic position to question, reflect, and have fun together with students and colleagues. This is how I choose to, to spend my time. What I have become more and more suspicious about uh, regarding ESD or ESE is that as something particular and unique, at least in the Swedish school system. I believe that we need, what we need to do is to first help teachers and teacher educators to analyze what they are already doing that fits under and work from there. And I think Sonia, uh, uh, had something, uh, uh, talked about something to that effect as well. So that means that I am boringly interested in and in favor of in-service training of teachers to that effect, and that teacher education policy and leadership should, should grow some courage and also engage in these issues 
in ways that might help change education, whether that change is reformative, revolutionary, or has to do with a just distribution of schooling. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, David. It's also a nice, uh, you already started responding to the other question that we may not get to uh, with the whole round of the panel, given the time. But uh, what, 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 I, you know, what I hear you say is the importance of, of nuance and preventing uh, that we come up with some kind of prescriptive form of what education should be and should look like and, and pretend that it might work uh, in a universal way, but mm. we need to have to be mindful of, of the contextual differences between people and communities mm. and the life world of the students, but also the local environment, um, mm. that we need to maybe not uh, push ESD as a subject or something that we need to teach in addition to what we already teach, uh, mm. but rather look at 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 maybe sustainability and sustainable development as a catalyst for for educational improvement, uh, mm -hmm. recognizing mm -hmm. what we already do and, and what we can maybe do better and maybe what we need to fundamentally change. Mm -hmm. I think a big part is also becoming aware of how in a subtle and unconscious way, education is actually amplifying unsustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes I hear, well, it's a very normative agenda to talk about care and love and solidarity. Um, uh, and uh, and in a way, and it is, <laughs> it mm. is. It's actually, uh, uh, and it's quite radical. They would say to me, and mm. I would say, well, what is radical is how we are destroying the earth. That mm. is radical. Mm. Um, and and at the moment, uh, you must also uh, you can bounce it back in a way uh, that 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 currently we are uh, uh, we are amplifying certain values. Uh, that prepare us to become diligent, flexible workers and good consumers who generate mm. an income who, that they're willing to spend on the market. And then mm. we become all part and co-opted of a system where our pensions are all dependent on the investments and in companies. And we all become kind of uh, accomplices in this system. And, and our mm. schools help us prepare for that, mm. Uh, mm. which is very normative. So, mm. so it's, mm. it, it's good. And the other thing that I hear you say is that we need to not simplify. We mm. need to, in a way, we need to complicate matters. We need to learn to oh, complicate yes. matters. And it's so, it's, it's so we love to simplify and draw neat boxes and make distinctions, mm. but we, we need to complicate things and we need to get rid of the binaries and the false mm. binaries and look, mm. look more for, for, uh, for, for boundary crossing rather than setting boundaries. And, mm. and we've gotten very good at that in our education to do mm. that, making distinctions and, and, mm. and, and putting us in boxes and, and disciplines and all that. And, and that is actually that engineering way of thinking has brought us Zoom mm. and the possibility to have this conversation, but it also has led to many other things that, mm. that are, are, are highly problematic. So mm. uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, now I'm also uh, mindful of the time. It's, it's 10 minutes past 11. Um, what I would like to do is ask the, pan the other three panelists, if they want to, having heard the conversation so far, if they want to say something more uh, that they feel, I wish I had said this, and it could connect to the question or it could not, it doesn't matter. So if you want, feel free to come in and, and take and not too long because we want to check the Q&A and maybe there are questions from the organizers themselves as well to the panel. So who wants to, to, to come in having heard all of us speak and feeling I really should add this or we missed this important point. And if you don't come in, and you risk that David will come in, and then you know he will go. He will add his to the wisdom he already shared. All right, it's silent. Oh yeah, I can come in. Yeah, come in. I would just, um, yeah, I, I just would connect. I guess some of the thoughts about. Um, needing that that deep democracy and the social foundation 
I mean, and again, I, I fully acknowledge that my, you know, my whole milieu of thinking is tends to be far away from many of the places that you all sit. But, but just to say really concretely in terms of some of the challenges that we face in, in expanding opportunities and quality and um, pushing the boundaries of sustainable, more sustainable orientations of teaching and learning. Um, it, you know, where we're talking about individuals who are doing, undergoing that process in a fragility and conflict situation. I mean, what, what we're talking about, there are academic institutions un, literally under attack. And we're talking about scholars at risk and, and you know, and then, and there are so many ways to engage with all of that as an academic community, right? Scholars at risk have so much to bring to thinking, to deep thinking on um, on fundamentalism, as well as on the arts and music, and as well as uh, you know, in our conception of history and where we see ourselves in the world, and you know, whether or not the we in the world we serve the world or the world serves us and capitalism and commun you know, consumerism and what have you. Um, and then also just as a minor point, and then uh, I see David's coming in, um, is on the issue of teacher training. And I mean, again, I know I'm always bringing this down to a really, really practical and far away level, but um, you know, teacher training, uh, this is one of the big areas that, that we work in with you know, UNHCR and partners, including UNESCO is, is in, access to quality education, which means investing in teachers. And this means investing in teachers at every level and everywhere. Um, yeah. And this is a big, you know, this is something that's been identified as a, a huge gap in, in um, the way we're going to monitor and report on the SDGs. Um, but it is, it is yeah. incredibly well recognized and important. So over. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, certainly uh, quality. There has been a movement for a long time that that uh, the, you know, like universal primary education in, in in schools has been pushed. But if the schools are not equipped and don't have the teachers and there's no quality education, then it could do more harm than good in many time ways. So that that emphasis on quality is is critical. I think, David, you want to come in? Yeah, just a short reflection. I think that, that uh, our everyday language uh, sometimes uh, has more wisdom than we give it credit for. For example, there is a time and place for everything. It's, uh, it's uh, something that we say often, and but it has a deep wisdom to it. So, so there is a time and a place for different ways of of, of revolutionizing or or um, or reforming or or keeping it just as it is. Uh, when it comes to education. And what we need is, is uh, engaged people that are able to, to identify these moments in time and place. What is needed here? What, what, that, what, 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 I mean, if you talk about sustainability education, what kind of education what is, is needed at this moment for these people in this situation? Because then we can address it, but 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 the system is not made up like that. The system is 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 a uh, is uh, a static old uh, statue that needs to be sort of pushed around with force around the world, and it, it's based on this old colonial ideas of, of what education should be. And and, and as a question at, in the Q and A, said. What, can we learn from refugees? Of course. The question is not can we, what can we learn? How can we learn? When is it important for us to learn? And, and having said that, it, I mean, it's obvious that I'm really get my kicks for reflection, sort of, and in the abstract, which is for me very concrete, but not, I know not for everyone. But having said that, there's also a time and place for action and thinking, right? So we also need people that can say, well, shut up, David. So now we need to act because now these people are hurting, right? So fine, you can write your books and do that. That is also important. But now I need to act in this, in this context. And so I'm coming back to that. What we are sort of in great need of is people with this sort of helicopter view that can help us to understand what kind of choices we need to make when yeah. we need to do them. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, you know, you started responding to Anya's question. Um, and, and maybe, Anya, if, if you want to come in, you're welcome to. 
to elaborate on that because you write quite provocative uh, you know instead of deciding to indoctrinate those people into our culture uh, and fit them into our rotten economic system you know uh, so the more dialogical approach also recognizing you know that if we don't reflect on on, on that and also the colonial colonial systems also views on education how can we decolonize education in a sense comes in here as well um and maybe other panelists would like to respond to to that question and then we can also go to leonie uh, leonie's question uh, after that anyone else uh, in the q a people can see anya's question and anya if you're there and you want to elaborate you're welcome to I can say something about uh, um, this because the arts is a, a, a absolutely fantastic venue or a place for people to meet. And if we're talking about quality of life or what we mean, you know, what, what do we mean by quality and, and uh, what, what do we want to aim for? Uh, um, I mean, a refugee, and I've seen a lot of these projects, sometimes initiated by refugees themselves, but also with refugee, refugees invited into uh, projects where, uh, where they um, can somehow um, have a dialogue about uh, what it means to be a human being, what it means to be in this situation, uh, but also to focus on positive things. And this is my, you know, kind of, I, I really go for, obviously we need to understand what is, uh, you know, kind of we have to pick up all, all the faults, but what is most important is that we, we kind of uh, search for the quality, because if we don't have quality, if we don't have love, uh, then, you know, what is the point continuing? So we need to know why to continue. And uh, also for uh, refugees and, and uh, integration and things like this, you know, it happens through connection, through dialogue. And the arts is the perfect place to meet because it's, it creates new worlds. It, it, it doesn't need to, uh, <laughs> it doesn't need to uh, kind of stick into this, you know, we, we ha need to tap into the imagination and hope and the, you know, creation. Yeah, thank you. And, and that is a nice bridge, I think, to, the, to Leonie's question about creating new worlds and being maybe more hopeful and more imaginative, uh, reimaginative futures. Um, I also must apologize to Anya because I realize that this is a webinar and, and it's not designed for people to come in and speak, apparently. So you're probably anxious to get in, but you can't. But thank you for your question anyway. So um, yeah, so uh, Leonie's question is about uh, student, uh, uh, many students, and I see this at Wageningen University as well here in the Netherlands, uh, um, ooh, many of which study uh, sustainability, climate uh, related uh, issues and, and, and food security and, and uh, uh, biodiversity conservation type uh, programs. Um, they 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 are um, i would say uh, suffering uh, from 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 what i referred to earlier already this kind of fear anxiety uh, and, and maybe loss of hope for the future and, uh, and the covid and uh, the, the pandemic has has certainly uh, aggravated this i think um, so the question that leonie is asking um, how can we um, um, kind of catch uh, students at the university in, in this case uh, uh, um, in a way that, I, I, this is my words, I guess, uh, that, that these wicked problems are not, are not paralyzing, but, but somehow create a possibilities for transformation, a hopeful transformation and a regeneration uh, and, and the deeper systems change that is needed. Um, and I can imagine that there are pockets of, 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 of this uh, niches, you, you sometimes hear the word niches uh, in universities, in communities uh, all around the world where, where you can see people trying to switch, change the system. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes it picks up steam and becomes a movement and things really tip but often it doesn't happen. But anyway, I'd like uh, to ask the panel, how, how do we create uh, 
uh, what do we do with this anxiety and, and how can we uh, as teachers uh, as many of us are in a way uh, or as policy makers how can we um, um, engage people in a hopeful meaningful way and 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 make sure that apathy and powerlessness is not the result of our education for sustainable development i see erka raising his, his hand thank you uh, i have some ideas of, of this this problem and i i think this this problem is partly also caused by our uh, current e educational system, which uh, seems to close the future from, from young people. There are several research findings that uh, young people do not feel that they are able to influence our common future. They may, may feel that they, they can influence their own situation in the, the probable future, but they don't see that they could make changes for the direction of development. Uh, and I think one, one solution or remedy for, for this problem is, is futures literature, developing uh, uh, abilities to, to uh, think uh, futures more broadly so that uh, young people could vision their uh, desired futures and, and not only, only be prepared for, for those futures which seem to be probable. And when you get this kind of um, futures thinking, then you are also able to take actions at the present moment to change the direction of development. And I also want to act, uh, add some ideas uh, which are developed by Finnish researchers on, uh, of environmental anxiety Panu Pihkala, and, and he has defined that hope is an ability to trust the meaningfulness of life despite the fact that the future is open. And uh, what Pihkala thinks is that we can strengthen our hope by practicing our ability to see the power of goodness in everyday lives and joining others to share uh, concerns and, and take common actions for the better future. So we must uh, see that the bad things in the world, we, we must be aware of them, but we have to keep our other eye open for, for those good things that are present all the time uh, in, in our environment. And, and then we, we should catch them and use them to do concrete actions for the better future. Thank you, Erka. Futures literacy is an interesting uh, emerging area, I think, indeed, that we that we should pay attention to. Uh, and I think, again, that uh, as Steinem was saying, Steinem was saying that uh, that uh, arts arts based approaches and, 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 and using uh, arts based methods to to imagine, help imagine and visualize hopeful, inspiring, more sustainable futures can be a very powerful way of doing that. Um, and, um, and then to think about how do we get there? You know, if this is the future we want and that we believe in and, and want to work towards what needs to be done to get there, kind of backcasting might also be an idea there. David, I think you will have the last word because it's five more minutes. And then uh, maybe the organizers, one of the organizers can, can say a few words as a, to close the session. Um, mm. Some reflections on whether it was what they hoped for and, and maybe some mm. kind of last word for follow-up possibilities. But uh, David, go ahead. Okay, uh, just two, thank you, Arian. Just two things about uh, uh, anxiety. I think that we are naive if we if we if we engage in transformative learning, the the this new, quite new at least, key concept in in, in sustainability education. We are naive if we engage in that and want and want to instill transformation in, in students and expect them not to be anxious. <laughs> because, because transformative learning is about uh, sort of re reflecting upon your, your, your basic frames of reference of the world. Who am I? 
What is this world? What is the future? What can I become? All these existential issues that are so important. And this process is not, it's easy for us because we already saw all these things. You know, we already know that this is, we need this, so we can talk about it. But for someone who isn't aware of this, this is, this is a shock. It might increase uh, um, anxiety, of course, despair, grief of a world that they once knew that they thought had a perfectly nice order. And then they know that, that uh, we all talk about its complexity and you can never know what happens and all your actions produce different, different uh, uh, consequences. So having said that, I think we also should look at this kind of emotional responses maybe at least tentatively as part of the learning process. So not as something that we need to help them to, 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 to eradicate, but to understand why it's there and what kind of meaning it can have in the context of learning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think this is, uh, I mean, uh, d- a Dutch colleague of mine, Gerd Bista, he talks about, the importance of subjectification in education yeah. eh? to, to yeah. think about be, being and becoming and who am I, who want to, who, who am I in relation to the world? Um, but there needs to be another question there too. I think uh, the question of how is my being and my becoming affecting the being and becoming of others and, and maybe impeding that being and becoming of others, other species, or even of the earth, you might say the earth also has a right to subjectification, but we are violently inhibiting the subjectification of the earth. So, but anyway, this is a conversation that could go on for, for, for a while and it needs to. Um, so I think, uh, and I think that's the idea of, of, of these kinds of panel discussions to open up conversations and to ask new questions. Um, but also, and I, I, I like this uh, this comment as well that we, we we cannot just rest and 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 lean back uh, and reflect all the time. Uh, we must all, and ask questions. It's easier to critique than it is to transform, in a way. And we also need to transform, and that that requires indeed action. And and that's beyond textbooks, as I said in the in the title of this. Uh, of this uh, um, discussion and of this uh, event. So I want to go back uh, to um, to uh, the, the organizers and I, I'm not sure uh, which one of you, uh, uh, Jessica or, or Lina or, or Christy, uh, would like to come in, maybe to say a final word to, to all of us before we sign off. Thank you, uh, panelists, it was a pleasure. Uh, to to have you and 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 thank you for inviting me as well to to kind of uh, keep the conversation going. So the floor is back to Jessica, me. Lina, or Christy. <laughs> I'm not sure who will come. Jessica. Yes, thank you very much, Arjun, and such an inspiring and lovely debate. Um, a lot more could be discussed, but time is limited. Um, Christelina and I would like to extend a huge thank you to Sonia um, and you, Arjun, and all of the other panelists, such an amazing contributions that we had today. And we also want to thank Estina Johansson from the Agenda 2030 Graduate School uh, Administration and Jonas, our technician, who are behind the scenes and yeah. As you saw, there was a chat cross crossing. Sorry about it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, but thanks to Agenda Graduate School for sponsoring uh, this event. And finally, thanks to you, dear audience, for coming and listening and joining us today. Uh, we hope that the event was very inspiring and hopefully more dialogues to, the, to this topic will be added uh, for the future. Let's keep in touch, I guess. So that's it from us. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.